love you. We adore you. We praise and exalt you. Thank you for your precious word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for being so real to us. Father, we love you so much. You're an amazing, an amazing Father. To whom all praise is due. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. For being our God. That you chose us. We didn't choose you. For that we love you. All your promises are yes and amen. healing, you said yes and you said amen. For our prosperity, you said yes and amen. For the breakthrough this morning, you said and amen. Woo! We love you so much. And all God's people said amen. Well, greetings to you. You may be seated. God bless you. I'll greet somebody at least and say, look, let them know they're looking better than the last time you've seen them. Amen. <laughs> Woo-wee. So it is the first time I got out of the house in four days. And I gave you a title for my sermon. What did I call it? I honestly did give you one. Blinded by the light. That's what it felt like this morning coming to church. Glory be to Jesus. You know, the pastors will find sermons in everything. eh? Good Lord. Well, there's a title for you. We're dealing on prayer and we're dealing about teaching a generation how to switch systems, how to get out of bondage and how to walk in the light of the gospel and the truth of God's word. And more than being saved is what they sold us being saved when we, when we grew up. Nobody told us about that. Um, there'll be maybe 50 year wait. I'm still waiting for Jesus to come back because the question was always that, what would you do if Jesus comes tomorrow? And I mean, it's a valid question, right? But nobody taught us how to live while being saved on earth. So I had to go studying and developing some things to help this generation know that he's given you a life that is worth the living. He's really come to give you life, life in abundance until to the full, until it overflows. And what we're doing is we, we're raising a generation with kingdom revelation and Um, for those that have been locked up in a religious system, you could find it the most challenging because it's for somebody who's 18, 17, the youngsters coming through, they don't know any other world. I loved what one of the daughters said. She says, I don't know religion. I only know the kingdom. And I know how to function out of the kingdom only. And that's a beautiful thing because she grew up in the promised land. But what if you grew up in bondage and all you knew is religion? Or what if you grew up in the wilderness? You got saved, but you've never seen your mother and your father make it into the promised land. You don't know how how to live. And so for many, it would be a place of maybe first unlearning. That's what Alvin Toffler said. The illiterate of the future is not those who cannot read or write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So we're dealing with a generation that's got to be taught how to develop in kingdom revelation and understanding. And I I woke up with this thought yesterday morning and the Lord said to me, I felt the Spirit of the Lord said to me, the most people do not believe that I really have a plan for their lives. Most believers do not really, really believe that I chose them, that I sent them to the earth on purpose to be locked into my plan and to 
bring their gift to the table. Most believe they're just an accident and God wants that person saved and God favors Brian, but not me. And it is such deception that this generation is living in. And what we're needing now to do is to raise a generation with kingdom revelation and to really teach, teach you about so many people that have been blinded by the light. Not by sitting in darkness. Most people are coming out now and begin to understand that the whole world is deceived. The whole world is living under the deception of the wicked one. Most of us are now waking up and I pray for this generation that it happens to you sooner. That you realize that this world has, there's nothing good from pharmaceuticals to education systems to governments. Every one of them are deceived. And the intention of the wicked one and when Jesus said he came to undo the work of the wicked one um, for this reason the son of man, man was made manifest you understanding it's true you're now beginning to appreciate your salvation like never before because you're realizing we were deceived there were promises of if you study um, and you get you know we mark you according to our standard and you go through our schooling system you're going to get a good job and yes you will pay for your degree um, but then you'll get a, a, a good job. And uh, because you got a degree, we can give you special loans for your house because you're a professional. And they lock you in on a system and tell you if you stay with the system for the next 60 years, when you're done, you're going to have a wife or, or a husband, you're going to have some children, you're going to have a house and have some cars, and you go maybe do on a couple of overseas trips, and you're going to die happy. And nobody told you that you could earn more than one salary a month. They only taught you how to clap 12 times a year. That's once a month. You must get paid. They trained you very well, didn't they? Like a little animal, they trained you. And if you do good and the economy is good, we'll give you a bonus. Maybe you'll clap 13 times. Nobody told you that you can start a business and have one payout that can square all your debt for 20 years. So I go and ask for a loan for my business and they say, no way. And I only wanted 120,000. No way. I asked for a loan for a bond of... 300,000 rand, that was 25 years ago, they give it to you. You ask for a car, they give you the loan because they're happy to have a happy customer and that you pay them regularly every single month. It's their system. You enrich them and you work for them, you build their companies, it's got nothing to do with your destiny, nothing to do with purpose, nothing to do with the plan of God, nothing to do with the prosperity in the kingdom, nothing to do with, you serve everybody else except God. Because they pulled God out of your schools and you don't even pray the Our Father. So you pound in a system and for many people, they're now beginning to have to get up and beginning to face the reality that in that system, you're never going to reach your destiny. That's the sad part about it. I pray that you don't wait until you're 75 and then wake up and realize you're going in the wrong direction. That's a long way to travel, Jimmy, before opening up your eyes. I'm praying for this generation that you begin to see the world for its wickedness. Its wickedness. You really got to start thinking about it. Shut up, devil. Today you're going to shut up. You realize even in the pharmaceutical industry, if they give you anything to heal you, you're no longer a client. 
Why would they give you something to make you heal? To, to make you whole? So when you come into the kingdom of God, the kingdom number one removes dependence. Please write that down. The kingdom system is now removing you from your dependence. You grew up in a, in a demonic system. It's the first thing that God starts dealing with you in your life. I take authority over you today in the name of Jesus. You will be silenced. My God. That's wicked, eh? Number two is denominational walls. You'll find out that the denominations were established by, demonic, by the demonic realm to separate people. Denominations can never solve this generation's problems. Here's the third thing you're going to find out. Is that you were living in deception your whole life. You don't even know who you are. Yet you are 65. You've, nobody introduced you to you. You don't know what you're capable of. You don't know the kind of resources around you. You don't know the kind of gifts inside of you. You don't know your potential. But you've been, you've been working the world system. You've never worked the kingdom system. And many people have been living in deception. The other one is demonic oppression. The madman of Gadara. You know that's satanic, right? My God. Psalms 107. Let's keep preaching. Psalms 107 verse 1, please. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His good, for His mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom He has redeemed from the hand of of the enemy. That's verse 2. He has, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. And gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he delivered them out of their distresses. So when you cry out to God, God's giving you to bring you out of your distress a kingdom revelation. Because when God gives you revelation, it is not to impress you. I'm not here to impress you. I'm here telling you that this is God's invitation to experience what is being preached. So there, that you can encounter the kingdom, that you can walk in the fullness of that and begin to see God in His fullness and what God intended in the earth. So when you operate in the kingdom, God wants to preserve you. He wants to preserve your family and He wants to preserve your life. So the kingdom of God was given to you to meet your needs independently from the world system. God has a way to, uh, to bring us out of deception, uh, dependence, denominations, depression, and distresses. Isaiah 42 verse 14. I've held my peace a long time. I have been still in restraint and, have rest and restrained myself. Now I will cry like a woman in labor. I will pant and gasp at once. I will lay waste the mountains and the hills and dry up their vegetation. I will make the rivers coastlands and I'll dry up their pools. I will bring, you come and read with me, Verse 16. Give me verse 16. I will bring the blind by a way they did not know. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. I want you to thank the Lord for that word over your life this morning. Come on, just shout a little bit. So when you understand, I'm not dealing with you, 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 you were stuck in a world system and what's happening is as we're preaching the kingdom message, you're beginning to come out of a cave, but... Many people are struggling to come out into who they really are and what God has called them to do because when truth hits, not all truth sets you free. Sometimes truth can make you miserable first. And because 
imagine giving your life to a system for 55 years and finding out it was, a, it was, it was deception. Promise after promise after promise and you're not getting there. And so when we begin to preach the gospel, in many ways, the light is now beginning to shine in your, in your eyes in many ways. Because the deception that you lived in is now beginning to break. And for many people, sometimes you bring them, you show them the truth, and they would rather go back and hold on to their deception because they're feeling some stability. They'd rather sit in the dark and hold on to someone else's hand that's been deceiving them called your job. But when you're coming into the light and you see God removing you from the dependence that you've had on the world system, it's very daunting. I struggled with it for many, many months. I wanted to, but I, I, I just didn't know how. The good news for you is that God has brought me through As it is with the head. You coming through as well. Okay, how must I say it to you? You're coming out of bondage. You're not going to struggle like I did. You're not going to toil like I did. You're not going to sweat like I did. You are not going to go and faint like I did. You're not going to fall over like I did. You're not going to get sick like I did. You're going to walk in the fullness of God's blessing. Everybody in this house said... Blinded by the light. Philippians chapter 3 verse 1, please. Have a look at this man. God's calling him into what he's been called to do. So Philippians 3 verse 1. If you guys can assist me, it'll be great. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, be, beware of evil workers, beware of the, mut of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in our degrees. Got no confidence in our background. Got no confidence in the color of our skin. Got no confidence in who we know. Got no confidence, got no confidence in where we come from. He says, for we, uh, verse 4 please, Though, he's, now he says, you, you, you want to talk about boasting in the flesh? He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I am also. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, they said, these people that are coming, they know the way. You need to persecute them. He says, I was the one they chose. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, not in Christ. He says, I was blameless. This is how I was raised up. But what things were gained to me? These things I have counted lost for Christ. Someone's going to hear me this morning. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them as dung. I count it as rubbish. Everything that I've gained in the world and its systems and the way I got trained, uh, my education, uh, my systems analyst background, my programming, my degrees, uh, everything I've got against the wall, I've pulled them off and I counted them rubbish. Keep going. Are you with me still? Verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. Have a look at this now. So he's explaining his conversion and he's dealing with this having to fulfill the purpose and the plan of God for his life because most people, born again believers, are not living in this. As your father, I love you and I want to see Christ formed in you and I want to see you fulfill every one of them. This is real. Everybody say the kingdom is real. Most people think they're an accident that you just, you know, your father and your mother didn't want you and you made too many mistakes. 
This has never changed. God wants you to fulfill your purpose in the earth. Acts chapter 22 verse 6. So he's relaying his story about his encounter. Please, if you can assist me, Acts 22 and verse 6. Now it happened as I journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me. And I fell to the ground and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? This is this degreed man. This is this man has got his, according to the worldly standard, he's got his life sorted out. And he believes he's doing the right thing. Please hear this. People who are deceived don't know they're deceived because they're deceived. You're so dependent upon the world system, have you? That job is not there today. You'll struggle. And for many people coming into the kingdom of God, this, this fight has been intense because the truth is that it's not that God is and can't be trusted. It's that you've never trusted Him. You've gone to church and you didn't pay tithes, pay tithes but you never trusted Him. You trusted in the job. Are we going to be honest in church this morning? Yeah, you, because the truth is that we can say we trust God until the job is gone. And you'll find out how dependent you were on that system. So when God begins to deal with you, He's going to remove the deception. He's going to move the depression. He's going to remove the dependency. And so I answered, who are you, Lord? And He said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. That means you are highly educated, but you are deceived. You're studying scriptures, but you have no encounter with me. And those who were with me indeed, now look, they saw the light and were afraid. But they did not hear the voice of him who spoke to me. So the first thing that happens to you when you get born again and you come to the kingdom of God, all I'm doing is shining the light. I'm bringing you out of your bondage. I'm bringing you out by the grace of not me. I'm talking about preaching. I mean, that's why it's called a pulpit. I'm bringing you out of the pit. I'm pulling you out of your pit. Get happy this morning. I know the Holy Ghost is the transformation agent, but I've been called to preach. You cannot have faith for anything you have not heard. I am your preacher. I am your Joshua. I'm bringing you into the promised land. God has given you a man in the earth to bring you out of your mess and out of your situation. That is the way it works. How will they know without a preacher? So he does not have a preacher. He, he, God, he has his God encounter. Because he's rather killing the preachers. He consented to uh, Stephen's death. So God says, well, I'll give you a God encounter. And when he has that encounter, he knows he's dealing with something far greater than what he knows. He says, what? And he says, so, so who are you? He says, I'm Jesus. The next question, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, arise and go into Damascus. For there you'll be told all things which are appointed for you to do. Are you hearing born again believer? There are things appointed for you to do. There are things appointed for you to do. Not just to go to church, find a job. There are things in the kingdom that must be done. That is assigned to your name. You are handpicked. You are chosen. There's not the reason why I'm preaching and the power. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. And in there is the purposes of God for you. And when you say yes to the purposes of God, the plan of God unlocks. And when you lock open the plan,
plan of God, you'll find your prosperities in there. And when you find the prosperity, you begin to progress with the right people. And when you get into that place, you might even stumble. And even though your feet get swelled because you're walking this earth, God can wash you down. And even if you made a mistake, you're going to continue to walk in purity. And everybody's getting the gospel of the kingdom saying amen. Now watch. What happens is when I preach to you or anybody preaches to you the kingdom, how many of you can be honest and say, you're not even sure where you're going to, having heard this message? Don't lift your hands. How many of you can be, can be honest and say, I've never heard this before? Be honest with yourself. How many of you are saying that, could this man be lying? I've never heard the stuff preached. Because the first time you get the light of the gospel, it blinds your eyes. You get blinded by the light you're getting. Because you're coming out of a place you were in darkness. Now I'm taking you by the hand, and the Holy Ghost is, and moving you out and saying, come and see what it looks like in the light. And you're being blinded by the amount of revelation that's coming. Because he's so steeped in his education, he believes he's right. And since I could not see for the glory of that light, I'm talking about the light of the gospel shining upon your life right now. That you are struggling to grasp even which way to go. Being led by the hand of those who were with me, I came into Damascus. That means when I get into the kingdom of God, I now come into a place of where I honestly can start off. If you're being honest, even if you are Paul, Saul, now converted to Paul, you're going to be honest and you're going to say, I don't even know where I'm going to. That was me. And that's the encounter for every single one of us. So I'm letting some young born again believer know that it is not an uncommon thing. You've walked into the kingdom of God and you knew about being saved, but you've never heard about purpose and the plan of God for your life. And you're struggling to deal with life and coping with what's coming at you. And I'm just letting you know today, the Lord says, do not go back into the cave. Don't go back. Do not return to the vomit. Do not go back. Like Lot's wife, the Bible says, remember Lot's wife. Don't look back. Do not look back. We are going somewhere in the season. And I'm letting you know by the grace of God, you're going to come out of every kind of bondage, any kind of trouble. If God healed my marriage, if God brought me into my purpose, if the power of God is on my life and there's an anointing, and it's not just me, but I've got witnesses all in this church of how God has delivered them and set them free. I'm letting you know, you know today that your family is next. Then a certain Ananias, devout man according to the law, having a good test with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up at him. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you. That you should know his will. You're sitting here because God has chosen you to know his will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He chose you that you may know his will. The reason why some of you are struggling to take this next steps and what to do is because you're finding so much light. But you, the Holy Spirit is taking you by the hand and leading you to a place of where all you're getting now is, it says everybody saw the light, but I was the only one who heard the voice. All you have today is a word. You don't even know what the future looks like. 
All you're having is, I just know I have to take the next step. Everybody say, that's faith. So let's understand something. Let's understand faith. To be successful in any profession, you need to understand it. So to be successful as a Christian, you're going to have to understand faith. Yeah, I'm going to give you 10 reasons for faith. Number one, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, please. I didn't give you all these scriptures this morning. So praise the Lord, you're going to have to be wide awake at the back there. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves is the gift of God. So number one is why do you need faith? Well, that's how you got saved. How many of you have seen Jesus? You haven't. All you have is his word. And you said yes to him. And his word saved you. Your faith in things unseen. That's what, how you got saved. Number two. Matthew chapter 9 verse 22. Faith makes you whole. Matthew chapter 9 verse 22. I'm going to help you. Keep writing at the back there. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38. We're coming. That's the next verse. Matthew 9, 22. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. You can't come to God without faith. And the woman was made well from that hour. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38. Make sure that you've got Romans 11 verse 20 as well. Give me Hebrews 10 verse 38. Now the just shall live by their faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. The just shall live by faith. That means the same way your natural body needs air to live. Your spirit man needs faith to live. The just shall live by their faith. There's no other way you can please God. There's no other way you can come into what God has got for you. That's the reason why the first time you get the gospel, it blinds your eyes. And the problem with most people is the reason why God will not give you everything you need to see, it will freak you out. If I knew what we had to go through all these years, I have told the Lord, you can pack, I'm packing my bags, I'm saved and I'm coming home. I'm not going to go through what I had to go through. Because he cons you with the anointing. So the best thing to do is just to know that I've got enough word for today. I've got bread for today. i got revelation for my season. I'm going to take the next steps with God. And whatever He says for me to do, I'm going to do it. Come on. The just shall live by faith. If anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Yes, number one, there's another one. You stand by faith. Did I give you that one? Romans 11 verse 20. Well done, guys. You stand by faith. Well said because of unbelief. They were broken off. And you, you stand by faith. Now that's got nothing to do with your eyesight. Have a look at um, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. I need to preach. Come. Help me, guys. Romans 5 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7. Did I say that? For we walk, come on, you say it, by faith and not by sight. Let me tell you the thing that you're looking at all every single day, from that bank account to your skill, to who you, your, your divorce, to the mistakes you've made, to where you come from, all the things you're looking in the natural is affecting your faith. Because sight, why did he blind him with the gospel? Is because sight is the enemy of your faith. The reason why some of you are not going is because you look into your bank accounts to decide which way I'm going to go. The reason why Sarah would go and say, give him Hagar to sleep with is because she looks at her body and she says, it's not possible. She walks by sight and not by faith. 
But Hebrews 11, 11 says, but Sarah also receives strength to conceive. That's going to be your testimony in the season. That God's going to give you a, a fresh kind of faith in the season. That you're going to rise up in resurrected strength and ability and power. Hebrews eleven six. without faith it is impossible to please God. Luke 18 verse 8 please. I'm on, verse, I'm on point number 7 already. The outcome of your life is determined by faith. Luke 18, 8. And then you can give Acts 20, 32 after this. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Faith is the substance of things you're hoping for. So you can't have faith for anything you haven't heard. That's why we preach the gospel. That's the reason why we give you the light of God's word. Because when you make the switch and you begin to trust in God and His word, uh, you're now taking Him at His word uh, and not depending upon your education. Do you know that God's got new relationships for you? And you know, you, we, we can talk about walking by faith, but we've got to be clear that we need to understand the subject because if this is how we're supposed to live, so God, I know, has called me to come in. I, you know, I now start to get a bit of a gift inside of me. In fact, I'm jumping. I'll give you the story. I'll give it as I'm done with this. What's, what did I say? Acts 20, 32. Thank you for listening. Thank you for taking some notes. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. So you can't receive your inheritance outside of faith. Verse 9. Romans 5 and verse 1. Romans 5 verse 1. And then um, Romans, uh, Galatians 3 verse 5, then we're done. And the rest of the scriptures I did give you. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Does God love me? Let me tell you now, by faith you're going to have to say God loves me. Because there's days you do things that are unloving. But you're going to have to by faith say, God still loves me. Amen. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Get Galatians 3 verse 5. You want a miracle? No? I heard one. I'll, I'll pray for you and your miracle. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So if you want to have a miracle, you're going to have to give God faith. So you're understanding the importance of the need for you to um, walk by faith. So when you, when you come into the kingdom of God, I want to explain this to you so that you can understand. If you have the triangle of last week, we're going to put that up. But give me Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 quickly, please. This generation is in trouble because they do not, number one, we need to explain faith to you so that you can walk by faith. Number two, you need to understand times and seasons because in time, you could be blinded because of the amount of revelation. Let me explain that. To everything, there is a season a time for every purpose under heaven. Every businessman, every father, every man. You must be here next Saturday. I'm doing a deep dive to show you how to get your money. I'm going to give you revelation. I'm going to show you how to walk this thing out by the grace of God. I am, I've, God has graced me. God has graced me. Because I'm, I'm busy working with business people that have been struggling for years. And then um, this particular one has been about maybe nine months in the making. And, and the world has changed for this businessman because um, of certain things that I've showed him. Here's the simplicity of the gospel. I'm going to show you the light. Because when you're so dependent upon your education and your background and what you, you're skilled in, you don't need the anointing. But the anointing diminishes in your life. Um... Let's put it in a positive way. The anointing increases in your life through use. If you don't use it, you lose it. So the more I depend upon God and His Word, the more God gives me increase. And the more I'm studying around and going to the podcast studios and laying out presentations, 
I got another leadership session after, after, this, after this with some lunch with some leaders. And the deep dive revelation about what it is to be in the kingdom of God and where, why volunteering and the like. I mean, God is so amazing. Because my mind thinks a certain way. Things must add up and I must know. So when I study someone's life, I don't know um, why did that not work out when I prayed for you? Or, or why did this thing... I, I, I do not believe that faith is like some, something that's like, you know, it either works or it doesn't. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. You, if I can't pass this model down to the next generation, then, then I'm doing them a disservice. That's why I'm giving you models and I'm giving you a way that you can create um, a, a blueprints. And so when a child sits with this, I can say, I understand what Apostle said when he spoke about times and seasons. Let me give you times and seasons. I feel an anointing in this place because to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. I want to give you now some secrets that's going to really help you. That's going to show you and empower you. Have a look at my graph, please. I want to show you throughout the scripture. I have studied this stuff. And if you're getting my book, Your Payday, you'll find some of these things in there. We, we're going deeper into master classes to help you understand. Every, every woman, you've got to hear me today. Why are your apostles preaching to you? Why I'm telling you? Purpose. When God puts you in time, nothing supernatural happens. In time, you discover the purpose of why you're here. Seasons are for things. Single ones. This is the reason why you don't have sex in time. You don't have that with him in time. No ringy, no dingy. Let him wait for the season and then he will marry you very quickly. I'm Apostle Max and I approve of this message. My wife was pregnant, man. My girlfriend. And the night I went and said, look, actually your daughter's pregnant. I'm so sorry. Well, let's go and see your mother and your father. So we go to my mother and my father. They're sitting there. My, her father says, no problem. I'll take care of her. If you want her, you can't see her again until you're married. Two o'clock the next day, we got married. I went to him, I said, give whatever you want. She's my wife. We're leaving. <laughs> the problem is you're giving people in time what you must only give them in its season. And in God's kingdom, the problem that you're having over here is that this generation is bombarded with things outside of its season. Give me Revelation, I think it's 12. I'll come back to this. Then I heard a loud voice saying in the heavens, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows, why? That he has a short time. You do understand that these seasons come. And he knows the season. He wants to take many with on, in the earth into that season of burning. He never created the lake of fire. God did. For him and, his, and all those demons. Not for you. He knows that's coming. And so what does he do with this generation? He throws in times and seasons. How can a 12 year old be coping with so much of men, mental issues? We were 21, we weren't even, we, I mean, we didn't deal with the stuff that this generation is dealing with. What's he doing? He's mixing time and season. Go back to my graph. Pay attention, man. 
You don't give your children iPads and access to your bank and your, and your, and your credit card. And 12 and 13 years old. You don't know what they're watching. They can't cope with the stuff. Because it was reserved for a season. Now when you come into the kingdom of God, God puts you in time for a reason. And because parents aren't in control anymore, the children are taking things that belong to a different season and they're using it in time and it's messing up there. Now you're finding depressed and anxious and worried. So when God deals with you and he now is beginning to develop you in his kingdom, he is not irresponsible. He's going to reserve certain things for certain seasons. There's certain things you will never get unless you've been faithful in time. There's three levels. I'll get into this next week and I'll touch with some of the leaders today, but this is part of a master class. You've got to be in time. There are three things that God's going to give you. And I'm teaching a little bit, but you need it. In time, you're going to find teaching. In time, you're going to find testing. In time, you're going to find a testimony. Because all of those are needed for your season. So when you study David, you'll find a faithful boy. He gets anointed because he's faithful. He's in time. Nobody sees what you're doing in time. That's the design of the kingdom of God. That's why you walk by faith and not by sight. Because your time that you it's a living thing. It's, it's the thing that every believer must go into. It's the way, it's, it's what we call the great equalizer. Because in time, I'm going to find out why you really, really here. Because if nobody comes to celebrate you, and nobody gives you the mic, I watch these leaders. They come in here and they got titles. And they say, I'm a pastor in another church. I take the title away. There's a man that I have to honor and salute this morning. You see that man over there? His name is Jester. Pastor, he's been known. Sat down with me the other day. This has been one of my toughest seasons to sit and do nothing. I led the church. Yeah, I get nothing. Recognized for nothing. But he sits and serves faithfully. Sows faithfully. You think that God ignores that? Because when God brings you in time, it's for testing, it's for your testimony, it's for training. I want you to clap your hands and celebrate every man that's been faithful in time. That's the reason why, honey, you don't marry him in spring and in summer. I want to know how he handles winter. And when he breaks out in sweats and can't get out of bed for four days, will he act all crazy or will he still love God, wake up on a Sunday morning and say, I need to go and preach again. You don't marry him in, his, in spring. We want to know what he looks like when that hunkers. No, it's problematic because you keep looking for seasons when she's looking good. What if she doesn't? Uh, let me not start with the woman because you, you, you got to wait, man. Take her through spring, summer. In fact, take her on holiday. Make sure that when she goes on to the beach and she has to, you know, get in that bikini and the sunshine that she's not pouring oil and taking off screwed parts and because this woman can do that now eyelashes comes off wig comes off and then she wakes up now you married her now she must put she must put oil on you just like, what is that i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm gonna blame it on the medication you need to test faithfulness I watch how people act. 
I would leave you in time because time is the great equalizer. I want to see how you handle things of the kingdom of God when you don't have your season yet. And everybody else got their breakthrough, but you can't celebrate with them. And you got jealous uh, over someone else's car that came in here. Now you know what about mine? And you, you, you can't clap your hands. And I, I say, clap your hands uh, for someone else. And oh, you, you're not going to do that because, uh, you know, I, I, oh, oh, really? Oh, really? I mean, who are you kidding, man? Can you celebrate the King of Kings? Can you praise him when someone else gets a breakthrough? Breakthrough. We're watching you. I don't miss those things. Why? I'm looking for leaders. And I'm watching how you handle the little. And I'm handling how you handle your downtime. Kai came here. I just want to serve you in a Give me a minute with all your leaders. I said, what? I want to tell them what an amazing man you are. I said, really? You need to tell them? I said, well, I must have done a terrible job. No, they don't honor you. They don't honor you. I said, well, they've only been here about maybe 15 years with me and 18, and you walked in here since yesterday. And I tell you what, don't worry about them. I give you some time. And when I went looking, where are you? Don't be blinded by this. This is a whole different level. You want God to develop you in time. You want to remain faithful in time. Because a faithful man will abound with blessing. You see, Matthew 18, verse 1, please. I know my time's gone. I haven't started preaching yet, but let me, let me, let me tell you where we're going to next week. You know, David's mighty man. David's anointed three times. The first time in his father's house in front of his brothers. Go back to my picture. I'll come back to this. David's anointed three times. The first time in his father's house, I found a man after my own heart. He anoints him. David gets anointed the second time in Hebron. Hebron means covenant relationships. It's where David's mighty men gathered. I'm teaching on, on level number two next Saturday. And if you're a wise woman, you'll sneak in at the back there somewhere. Teach you about vows and commitments. You don't build anything in the kingdom of God without the vow. And you don't make the vow when the things are coming. You make the vow before the things come. I'm going to teach a generation that doesn't know how to handle time. Because I'm telling you what I feel in my spirit, why I have to preach this stuff. I feel we are about to hit the season. The season's going to make your head spin. I am preparing, I don't know who you are, but this might not be for everybody. But for somebody in this house, a season's going to hit where you're going to see the power of a living God in your life and your family. I'm letting you know that the business is going to flow like water. I'm letting you know that there are new relationships and the power of a living God that's going to hit in a place. You're going to say amen in this house. You see, you see, let me, let, let, let me give it to you. When, when David's in time, He's killing a lion and a bear. That's his testing. That's his training. That's his testimony. Nobody saw it. Nobody sees it. When David comes into his season, all David is doing, for the sake of time, I'm going to just jump through the scripture. Go and read it in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17. What is David doing? Give me 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 10. It's important that you see it. There's another scripture. I think it's verse 10. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 10. Uh, so the first thing is there, Goliath is defying God's people, the army. Keep moving. I'll pick up a scripture. Keep moving, verse 11. 
Saul heard of it. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. There you go. Now we speak about David. Verse 14. David was the youngest and the three oldest followed Saul. Verse, next verse. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine? I missed it. I missed it. The point is, he's standing with his dad. He's taking care of the sheep. And his father says, go and serve your brothers. David, the Bible says, when he wakes up, he leaves the sheep in the hands of a keeper. David is not irresponsible. It's tested in the house of God. Whether you be faithful with the little things that nobody sees. And I watch unfaithful people looking for a season. But they've been unfaithful in time. His faithfulness in time shifts him into a season. He didn't go looking for Goliath. He didn't even know what the reward was. He didn't even go looking for a platform. He didn't even build his own social media platform. He didn't even want to try and build his brand, hanging around with people. We're watching how you're trying to get famous with other people. Are you ignoring the time God's got you in? Why must you wait until next year to learn the lesson all over again? For to everything, there is a season. Things are for seasons. Time is for purpose. If you don't know what's going on in your life right now, it's the most beautiful time to be praying our Father. Because God, as you serve and as you sow, as we train you up in the season, David comes onto the field. He says, so what, what do we get? So why are you allowing this man to swear and curse at you people? Are you not, do you not know that he's uncircumcised and we're in covenant with God? And so, David is walking by faith. He's not looking for a season. He's only in time serving his father. God created the season. David takes Goliath's head off. Gets the reward. Never goes back into time serving the father and the sheep. He walks into an open door into a new season. Because now you enter into a season, new relationships, new doors, and access on a different level. Here's when it becomes really powerful. When it comes in there, when you enter into your season, where people didn't even invite you to a birthday party, you know how they, they go through the list? I'll invite that one because they come with a gift. And that one can at least bring some, 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 some baked bean salad, but... I know that person can't even bring her. And you don't even make the list. I was there. Nobody invites you. Nobody. Because they know if they have to invite you, they must give you petrol to come as well. <laughs> oh Lord, I... Jesus help me this morning. When David comes into his season, Jonathan strips himself and empowers David. Because when your season enters, God gives you new relationships that will establish you on a brand new platform so that when you function, you're not going to look at anything like where you come from. God dismantles and disconnects you from the people attached to your history and then ties you to the new people concerning your destiny and God begins to open new doors for you and debt free living comes and it's a brand new season I'm letting somebody know I don't know somebody is so close to a new season there's a new season. 
there's a new season. If you've been faithful in that which is little, I'm letting you know God's about to swing this thing. I feel it in my spirit. I've been, I'm letting you know I've been praying over a word in the season. I'm letting you know somebody has been. I'm not talking about you doing your own thing in time. I'm talking about somebody who's been faithful and saying, God, you know my heart. You've been seeking the face of God. You've been traveling a long way. What's this lady's name? Who is she? I need her up front here. Bring her up front here. I need to pray for her. What is, what is your name? Lerato. You, you, you're stepping into a season. Come here. Let me, let, me, let me tell you the name I should be giving you. Your name is Ruth. Let me tell you, Shekendelebo. Listen to this apostle. Listen to this prophetic word upon your life. I'm prophesying this over you. You made a decision to break away from the people that you came from. Listen to me. The struggle of Ruth, having lost what she's lost in the previous season. She made a vow to go with Naomi. And she stepped into a harvest that was so huge. She stepped into a season. And I want to prophesy that over you right now in the name of Jesus. That the power of Almighty God comes upon you. Receive that right now. Receive that. Come on, clap your hands. Someone's about to enter into a brand new season. Come on, shout yes. That's the system of God. And as long as you're honoring God in time, nothing goes unnoticed in the heavens. Nothing. God sees everything. You can't fake it in the kingdom. If you've been unfaithful there, I can guarantee you, your season will be another lap around the mountain. God don't anoint nothing. He doesn't bless ignorance. He's not a deceiver. I lead these Muslims all the way through the story, right, of the cross and why Jesus. And we're having this conversation. And I said to them, I want you to know that all God's work that He does, His work is in truth. I said, now, you understand you have a need of a savior. Let's go, go past Jesus. What are you going to do with your sin? Build up my case. And I get all the way to the cross. And I said, now imagine that a God that loves you so much would die on the cross for you to save you from your sin. Past, present, and future. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, it would be. So I'm letting you know that Jesus died for you. He says, not. I'm letting you know that God is a deceiver. True. In their conversation. Allah is a deceiver. Because he took Jesus and where you thought you crucified Jesus, he put Barabbas in his place. That's why they believe. How could you ever believe that God would bless deception? Why do you think that God would allow you to go give bribes and cheat on people and the way you got your stuff and bless it? Then you would think, well, this is great. Let's keep on going. God would not. He'd put your life on pause and he'll keep you in time until you've learned the lesson. Because when you get the lesson, he switches you into your season and your eyes are opened and you're hearing his voice and you're walking out what God has got for you. God doesn't bless nothing. People, I mean, you know, just God wants to bless us all. That's the reason why Cardi B can do what she does on television and say, the Lord blessed me. It's like, who the hell? This is the deception of this generation. So we all look like we're blessed, right? And so you run after her and her brand. And you just want to get your platform and you want to sing your songs and you want to be on the stage. Oh, shut up, man, and sit down. Just sit down. Because the God that you serve, time is the equalizer. If you can't behave in time, we know that when we bring you onto the stage, you're going to miss. Perform. 
Write this down, please. When we ask you to submit in time, we're not here to control your gift. We're here to suppress your appetite. Your appetite for the light is a problem because you'll hurt anybody to get there. If you made a mistake, God throws you back in time. Tell Skane, he says, go back in time and come back the way I gave it to you. And we all like to jump because the season's coming. But I'm letting you know there are certain people that have been faithful. And let me say this to you. You might not even have sown much in this house. That's not how it works. You could have gone and sown in Ireland and been faithful. And you can reap here in South Africa. Because there's no separation in the kingdom. It's not like God's got certain eyes for England and certain eyes for Africa. No, whatever a man sows, he's going to reap. Now, if you've been unfaithful, then you must make it right. But if you've been faithful, even sowing in another man's ministry, and you've never gotten the reward, I'm letting you know you've stepped into a harvest season at Kingdom Life Embassy. This is the season of breakthrough for God's people. We have been sowing. It's time to reap. Everybody say harvest time. Harvest time. Harvest time. Shout yes. Ruth never sowed one seed to Boaz. Never planted one seed in that field. Let your neighbor know, I just stepped into my harvest. Amen. You've been, you've been faithful. You've been sowing. God has seen your sowing. He's led you. He's led the blind by the way they did not know. Someone's coming into it. To, by tomorrow morning, a phone call's going to come. You're going to say, I did not even realize. Oh, this job is available. Oh, this business deal's available. Everybody say, Harvest time. It's called a season. If you get that principle, your life will never. Be the same again. Because you'll be jealous of nobody's stuff. Do not, Galatians please, please be seated. I know I need to end. Galatians chapter, I think it is verse 5 or 6 or something like that. I gave you scripture. No, there's another Galatians somewhere else. Let me. <laughs> 6 verse 9, thank you so much. Let us not grow weary while doing good. For what? Read with me. For in. Come on, say it, man. Don't you think there's some things that are due? You believe the things that are due? You believe you sown? Yeah, did you repent in time? Did you discover who you are in time? Did you get and the lesson for that? Listen, God can't keep you in time all the time because you'll get no harvest. I need some supernatural thing. So I sometimes have to be in time and then when I hit my season. Uh. Let, 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 let me help you. Let me help you how it works. Because you see, David is in time and David is now serving his father and his season's about to come. When David's season comes, David breaks into a whole new level and he gets debt-free living. But while David is now in his season, the lights have gone on for David. The people are singing, Saul killed his thousands, David killed his ten thousands. While they're singing and, and, and the anointing is there, Saul's getting jealous and he throws the spears at David. David now has to run and David, even though he's in the season, he runs back into time. Because he's in the wilderness. But he's not there hanging out with the girls in the wilderness, sleeping with the girls. 300 dysfunctional people, distressed and indebted people come to him. David takes his breakthrough. David never went to go and buy a chariot with mag wheels.
Because in the kingdom of God, when God blesses you, it's with responsibility. So he takes the level of breakthrough that he gets and he feeds the 300 that are indebted. He gives them three square meals and he trains them up on kingdom revelation. David never wasted a battle and he never wasted a breakthrough. What did you do with the last million God gave you? Why should he give you another? Because where did the kingdom fit in on the ecosystem based upon your breakthrough? God looks at you so, man. God looks at how you give your time. God looks at how you handle kingdom business. God looks at everything. Because you're gonna, in your whole kingdom walk, you're going to swing between a time and a season. More time, more season. It's not back to the sheep folds. It was on another level because you live life on levels and we arrive in seasons. So the way God works is going to swing you between a time. I need to get, what is the lesson, Father? What's the training? What's the lesson? What's the testing? What is my testimony? When, when he got the testimony right, he raises up 300 of them. Others add on to him in Hebron. And he stays there for seven years. And then God kills, finally Saul dies. David goes to the next level. He's anointed in Zion. But he takes the army that he fed and trained and he, they work with him in Zion you don't waste your life in the kingdom the kingdom you're not wasting your time you're creating schemes I keep on hearing the Ponzi schemes I don't know who's involved in it or who's even trying to start it I'm letting you know it's demonic whoever's trying to sell it to you it's not God whole week I'm hearing the Ponzi schemes Ponzi schemes. No man. Walk past Ponzi. Go to principle. Build your life of kingdom principles. Please let's stand. I'm done. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord. In time, there are three things. Your testing, your training, and your testimony. You need to ask yourself, how are you doing? If nothing supernatural is happening in your life, what's happening in time? What is God blessing you with? If it's not your harvest, then it must be your seed. What's God training you up in? Have you not got the lesson yet? Because I'm giving you the light, but I'm letting you know you hearing the voice behind my voice. Paul said, I was blinded by the light, but I did hear a voice. You should be hearing a voice behind my voice telling you what to do and which way to go because God's leading the blind in a way they did not know. That's the kingdom. Just begin to pray right now, please. Just begin to pray right now. Shehe kende de babondo go sandalaba Raye kende de babondo go sandala gabande Father we thank you thank you that we can hear your voice let them hear the voice behind my voice thank you my god we were blinded by the light but we are walking by faith and not by sight we're trusting in the lord with all of our heart come on pray pray like you need to hear his voice Someone's coming into their season. Someone's coming into a season. Ruth is stepping into a harvest. The kingdom is manifesting all around you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's a testimony. It's called a Monday morning testimony. I keep hearing in my spirit, there's a Monday morning testimony. Somebody say it's a Monday morning testimony. Something you're going to know was birthed in the house this morning. It's called a Monday morning testimony. Is there anybody who can believe with me this morning? Where are you? Monday morning testimony. Just lift your hands and say, I think it's me. Say, say at least I think it's me. I, oh, I believe it's me. Come on. I believe it's me. It's got to, you got to believe this morning. Glory be to Jesus. If you have never made Jesus the Lord of your life, 
Every head bowed and eye closed, please. Once you did and you know you're far from Him. You know you've been living in deception. Broken, anxious, demonic dreams. Don't know what to do and which way to go. No direction for your life. And now you're hearing this kingdom message. I'm praying that you hear the voice behind my voice because God is calling you. You're not here by accident. You walked into this church on purpose. God ordained it that way. That you're going to hear this voice today. You're going to hear this message today. He changed this message so that you can hear. That He loves you and that He has a plan for your life. That He doesn't want you to waste your time anymore. He wants you to use your time for the kingdom of God. He wants you to, to show you what seasons look like when you serve Him. There's a payday attached to your life in serving God. I want you to know today that God loves you and that He has a plan for your life. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, or once you did and you know you're far from Him, you're outside of His will, can I pray for you this morning? Lift your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me and I'll pray for you. Lift your hand and lift it high and I'll pray for you. Lift it high and I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You lifted your hand. Should have, should have lifted your hand. Just come. I'll pray for you here. Just come. Just come. Be bold. Come. Come, son. Come. 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 Glory be to Jesus. Everybody reach out your hands. The younger, the better, man. The younger, the better. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I believe you died on the cross for a sinner like me. Today, I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for washing me in your blood cleansing me of my sin. Thank you for giving me a brand new start. From today, I belong to you. You belong to me. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen and amen. So proud of you. John, please go with him for two minutes. Go with him. Amen and amen. Please be seated. Let's receive an offering. A message like that should let you know whatever a man sows is going to reap. I tell the story in my book about how a certain gentleman came to my house every end of the month. Wouldn't see him the rest of the time. Even if he had money, he wouldn't see me. Will he bring his family and he'll call me straight after church, what you doing? I know the only answer would be well, we've got to eat. Well, we're coming, so what would you like? And he would lay out his menu with the kind of cool drink he liked as well. And after the sixth time, I'm driving down, going to go to the spa one more time. And I'm so, and I'm a, I'm a born again believer, and I want to do what's right. I mean, I, then I didn't even think about manipulation and some people that actually are manipulators in the kingdom. And I was just learning my way through the stuff. And, I just want to do any, I know that I want to honor God if he says so. If he puts a need in front of me, we'll sow, we'll help, we'll develop. And as I'm driving down, I'm so mad this time. I know that even though I'm going to sow this thing, it's not coming from a good place. I might as well not have done it. And so the condemnation's there and blah, blah, blah. And as I'm driving, the Spirit of the Lord says to me, Son, if you're sowing what he's sowing, then you're going where he's going. Remember, if you sow it with a pure heart, you deciding the outcome of your own destiny. You see, whenever God is dealing with you in time, he's not dealing with things you don't have. He's dealing with the things that you do have. How you sow in someone else's life. I mean, I went in there and I bought him exactly the cooling that he likes and exactly the chicken the way he likes it. And I with a smile bride it again for him. 
And well, today I'm here and anyway, let's leave that there. It's the measure that you use, man. It's how you sow. Nobody can determine the outcome of your life except you. You decide how much you're going to sow. It's the measure that you use. If you sow with a cheerful heart, you're giving into the kingdom of God, you see a need and you're meeting it, God will take care of yours. God's no respecter. Everything is registered in the heavens. Everything. We can thank God for the blood. Because the negativity and the things that was wrong, I mean, you know, some of you are going to have to reap some of the stuff you've been sowing. But I'm talking about the stuff that you're doing for the kingdom of God, that God is watching. I mean, Jesus spoke more about money than he spoke about hell. Imagine that I would stand and say, just make sure you see everybody's giving their offerings. Let's see how much you put in. Who are you? Oh, how much in your bank account? How much you put in there? Jesus did that. He's watching how everybody's putting money in their offering. And he says, this old woman, she's given more than everybody else. I can see social media going all crazy tomorrow morning. But please hear me, man. You can't fake it in the kingdom. God knows how much he gave you. Ananias and Sapphira, they come and they sell their property and they pretend they're giving. And he says, you've lied to the Holy Spirit. You can't fake the stuff. Business people hear me. You can't go in half bribe and say, well, I'm trusting God. You can't do that in the kingdom. One is morality and two is money. You're going to be tested. How you deal with money, natural stuff, determines the kind of anointing you walk in. You can't fake the stuff. Okay, start the church, Lord. I'm ready. I take 200,000 rand. I know we're going to, you know, if, if ever I'm people, the offerings, I put money aside. I say, I'm ready to start the church. God doesn't speak another word to me until all the 200,000 was gone. So I said, Lord, when you start the church, he says, are you ready now? Because you're never going to take credit for what I do. You can't walk in deception. You, can, you can't lie about the fact that you were dependent upon the world system. The sooner you repent in time, the better you get into your season, the quicker your season comes and God restores and puts things straight. I pray a blessing upon you and your giving. Please hear me one more time. All God's work is done in truth. Father, um, I, I do have a need in the church. We want to replace amps and mics and do some things. Give me the budget, Brian. What are we dealing with? A round figure. Can I call for 50,000 or 500,000? What do I need? 500, it's 500,000 better. <laughs> no. I just told you, speak the truth. Can I call for 50,000? As the Lord will give you, we're having a normal offering, tithes and offerings, but please. We're going to replace amps. We've been calling for that, mics and, and the like. Let's fix some stuff. And then business people, I will see you next week. Well, the kings. And then we're going to be dealing with business people. I'll show you how far we are and how we've developed so far. But I'm really enjoying the mysteries of how the kingdom works to show you where your money is. A businessman for the last nine months got all his business deals together, knows all the partners and then doesn't know how to put it together. The Lord gives me a word for you. The Lord says, if you increase your intent for my kingdom, tell him, if he increases his intent for my kingdom, I will increase his, his extent. I will enlarge his borders. But he must make a fresh vow and a commitment to my kingdom first, then I will bless him. So you mustn't just go to faithful, you must come to a new level of commitment and vow. Because it's a covenant relationship. And if he does that, I will show him where the money is. My God called me up this week, spinning everywhere. Everywhere. Because when your intent for the kingdom increases, and you made a vow to God in his kingdom, he will show you exactly where the money is. He will show you exactly where Jonathan is. He will bring you right to the entrance of your breakthrough. He will open up the doors of the palace, and you'll go in and possess your possessions. 
But see, in time, your heart must be set for the kingdom of God. There is no deception. You can't deceive God. He's not a deceiver. You're not worshipping Allah. He's a righteous God. And you've got to operate in truth. And he's not afraid to deal with your anger and whatever you've been dealing with. Fix it in time. Nine months later, his head is spinning. He says, now pray for me because I'm catching, I'm trying to catch up with all the stuff that's happening. I have to pray for him every day because I've trained him up how the kingdom works. It's simple, man. It's not complicated. But you have to trust and you have to obey. Father, bless your people in the giving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.